Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss the broad fish tapeworm, Typhilobothrium latum. And you'll notice that the introductory slide that I'm presenting to you has a book cover on it. It's a book published by Robert Dezowitz called New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers. As we begin our discussion of Diphilobothrum, you'll see why this book has become a popular classic in the field of modern parasitology um, with regards to knowledge that parasitologists want to share with the lay public. First of all, let's discover where Diphilobothrum and its relatives are found. <clears throat> when I say relatives, there are now, um, because we can examine their genomes, there are many, many different species of uh, Diphilobothrium, which all fall together within the same uh, general scheme of things, and in fact a wide variety of mammals, all in the northern hemisphere and mostly in the subarctic and arctic. But because it's such a large worm, it was easily discovered. And in uh, a 1609, Platter actually described an entire tapeworm, which was derived from a patient who had succumbed to another disease and presented on autopsy um, as harboring this tapeworm as well. So he got an, a chance to say how long this worm is. This worm can go over 30 feet in length. That's an enormous length of biomass that sits inside of our small intestines. And of course, Linnaeus uh, is responsible for naming it Diphilobothrium latum. Now, the life cycle of all tapeworms are complicated, but none are more complicated than this one. <laughs> so, um, I'll take it slow and we'll work our way through this and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The infection in humans begins by the ingestion of raw or undercooked fish. And that's the reason why it's called the fish tapeworm. Not because it infects fish, but because the adult worm infects humans through the act of eating raw fish. And these fish have to be freshwater fish. And as we'll see, there are some fish that sort of cross the border between fresh and salt water. They're called anandromous fish. And as a result, um, we catch them when they're in fresh water. In one good example is salmon. And we like our salmon sometimes raw or smoked or um, prepared in ways which allows this parasite to survive. The worm is present along the muscle filaments of the uh, body of the of the fish it lies just underneath the skin and if one were to tease out the muscle tissue of the fish you'd be hard pressed to find the parasite versus the muscle fibers that also are um, produced when you when you rub the meat with a let's say a knife for instance to to release the fibers from the myo myomeres <clears throat> So they're hard to, to tell whether they're in the flesh of the fish or not. That's my point. So we eat the, the stage of this parasite, which is destined to become the adult. The, uh, it's called a pleurocercoid stage. It's a larva of this parasite. The meal then passes through the stomach to the small intestine. And the worm that's released in the stomach as the result of digesting of the, of the proteins by pepsin uh, releases the young, soon-to-become adult worm. The adult worm attaches itself to the wall of the small intestine by opening up its bothria. Apparently, the word bothria means groove, and it's got two grooves, one on either side of its scolex, so it can attach itself in either direction. And it does so by creating a suction and then lifting up on it, and it remains attached at this in this fashion. Then, like all the other tapeworms we've discussed so far, the adults at least, this tapeworm feeds on a little bit of what we feed on. It absorbs it through its tegument, which have a series of microvilli all over the cells, all the way down the body of this worm. <clears throat> and that's how it grows. It may take three to five months for this worm to achieve full length adulthood. The, the segments of this worm, the proglottids, are much different in morphology than the tineids. And as we can see here, the proglottid is wider than it is long. So we've got some characteristic that's given part of its um, physical description to the name of this tapeworm, the broad fish tapeworm, so named because of the broad uh, aspect of its proglottids. 
These proglottids break off after they get filled with eggs. The gravid proglottids break off. And in fact, they break up inside of the large intestine. In doing so, they release the eggs, and the eggs are now free to pass out in the feces, and they must enter fresh water if this life cycle is to continue. What happens next is quite amazing. The egg contains a larva that's termed the coracidium, and this coracidium uh, resembles uh, zooplankton. It is a, uh, a round organism with cilia, and it's free swimming. So at this moment in its life, Diphilobothrium latum is a free-living worm. These small swimming stages are attractive to other predaceous zooplankton, namely the copepods. They're attracted to the swimming motion of this stage. And as we'll recall, um, when we uh, think back on um, Dracunculus metanensis, when the larvae were released in the step well, uh, the copepods were attracted to the swimming motion of the larvae that were released there too. So copepods are omnivores. They will eat anything smaller than themselves, basically, that looks like it's alive. And in doing so, of course, uh, it becomes duped into serving as an intermediate host. And the parasite then penetrates through the stomach wall of the copepod into the muscle tissue. And it transforms into the first larval stage of this parasite called the procercoid. It takes several days for this stage to develop. And indeed, what happens next is part of an ecological food chain. The copepod is then ingested by a minnow the minnow then um, releases the procercoid from the muscle tissue of the copepod by digesting it. The procercoid then can penetrate the gut tract of the minnow and lodge in the muscle tissue. And there it grows into the last larval stage, the pleurocercoid, which is the infectious stage for humans. If this minnow happens to be eaten by a larger fish, such as a salmon or a trout or a pike or a perch, then the pleurocercoid stage can exit from the fish that's eaten and somehow manage to find its way into the muscle tissue of the predator fish. And those fish are popular in terms of game fishing. Uh, people who fish for a sport and keep their catch and take it home and eat it <clears throat> are likely in northern latitudes to encounter at least some of those fish uh, harboring the pleurosarcoid of a Diphilobothrium species. Now, the most common species, of course, is Diphilobothrium latum, but there are many others that, as I mentioned earlier, that are also associated with this genera. The consequences of this infection are um, rather interesting also because it's unlike all the other tapeworms that we've discussed so far, uh, in that what we what we end up with in some rare cases is a metabolic disorder, uh, which is uh, directly attributable to the fact that this adult worm can in, can absorb all of our vitamin B12 that we eat. Our dietary vitamin B12 all ends up in the tissue of the of the parasite rather than us. Let's look at some examples of the anatomy first. Here we have a, the scolex of an adult Diphilobothrium latum, and on either side, you can see the two bothria. They're not well shown here, but these shadows represent uh, a cleft inside the tissue of the tapeworm, and, and you can see how this might be translated into a groove. The proglottid is shown here, and the eggs are collected in the ovary and into the uterus. And uh, this is the stage, of course, which, when it breaks off, releases those eggs into the intestinal tract. The egg <clears throat> gives rise to this free swimming stage, the coracidium, and this is a stage that possesses hooklets, like so many of the other, the other larvae of tapeworms. These hooklets are very useful in allowing it to penetrate through the tissue of the copepod and come to rest in the muscle tissue. And here's an infected copepod to demonstrate that. And upon closer inspection, here is the procercoid stage. The hooklets are still intact, 
and it's embedded inside the muscle tissue of the copepod. Now, as I mentioned, most people who acquire adult infections don't suffer anything from the result of that. Uh, we have a large amount of vitamin B12 stored in our tissues, particularly in liver. And as a result, it will take some three years for the dietary um, absorption of B12 by the worm to force us to release the reserves of vitamin B12 in our own tissues. So it may take a long time for this to actually manifest itself. The end result, of course, if we are going to end up in a vitamin B12 deficiency is uh, a condition known as megaloblastic anemia, where the red cells are larger and paler because they actually contain less um, hemoglobin than normal red cells. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. This is a male in his 30s. He presents to his physician with several days of stomach upset and an uncomfortable feeling in his legs. He initially did not think any of this until he noticed odd motile objects in his stool. Now, this individual was in Vancouver in British Columbia, and he reports eating a significant amount of salmon. He reports that all the salmon was either dried through a smoking process or had been marinated in a dill marinate. Um, his physician, um, obtains these objects that he has noted in his stool, these motile objects. Uh, he sends them off for testing, and he treats the patient with Praziquanto. All right, let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Now, in most individuals, infection with the fish tapeworm uh, results in no obvious symptoms. Um, however, infections with multiple worms uh, may cause nonspecific symptoms, such as water diarrhea, fatigue, um, and rarely, and this is going to be if you have a really high burden, you can get mechanical obstruction of the small bowel. The classic thing that we think about associate with um, fish tapeworm um, infection is exhaustion of vitamin B12. But this is a slow process. This takes many years. Um, and in some cases, you're actually going to see eosinophilia. What about the diagnosis? Segments of the worm in stool sometimes alert the patient that um, uh, might, something might be going up. But um, usually the proglottids break up in the intestinal tract. So often the patient isn't going to see these unless there's a significant um, burden. So it's really going to be um, doing microscopic examination um, of the stool for the, um, for the eggs. Um, there also are molecular tests, um, which not only help with the diagnosis, but they also can help with species determination. Um, but, you know, at this point, um, most of the diagnosis would be done by doing a stool ova and parasites looking for the ova um, under visual microscopy. I actually think this is quite uh, attractive, this, um, though they're short and fat and don't have so many branches, it looks to me almost like Japanese art. So sort of a beautiful um, proglottid here with the uterine segments. Uh, here's one of our eggs. Uh, here's our nucleic acid amplification uh, testing apparatus. Uh, treatment, uh, Praziquantel is the treatment of choice, the recommended treatment, uh, single, single dose. Um, an alternative is um, niclosamide. The drug of choice, as mentioned, is Praziquantel. Um, again, we're going to be interfering with the um, invertebrate calcium ion channels. Now, what about our patient? Now, the patient reports that by two days later, he had received his treatment. He felt better. Symptoms had all resolved. He didn't see anything else in his stools. Um, and the objects actually were identified. Uh, they were sent out to a reference lab, and these partial proglottids um, uh, were a, an interesting, a um, diphilobothrium nihokayense, an interesting um, fish tapeworm that this individual was infected with. Preventing and controlling infection with diphilobothrium involves sanitary disposal of feces, of course, both in rural and urban settings and cooking or freezing solidly all fish before eating. Now, <clears throat> the reason why Robert Dezowitz wrote about Jewish grandmothers uh, in his book about uh, how parasites are acquired by people is one of his chapters was entitled Jewish Grandmothers. And indeed, in order to um, um, place that reference in context, it was very common in, um, in many households, particularly Jewish households, for uh, the celebration of certain holidays with uh, traditional dishes. And one of those dishes happens to be gefilte fish. 
The making of gefilte fish was um, culturally left in the hands of the women in the house. Men did not involve themselves in producing gefilte fish as a as an entity, and so therefore the mother, who had all of the um, recipes for the gefilte fish, which was passed down to her from her mother, was in charge of of making this dish. And the daughters in the family would learn from the mother. And the mother, in order to demonstrate which stage of the gefilte fish it was at before it was going to be cooked, would take fish of various species, all freshwater fish, mostly consisting of carp and um, perch and um, walleyed pike, which are found throughout the Great Lakes regions of the United States and in, in Canada as well. Taking these fish, um, filleting them, deboning them, and then macerating those three fish tissues together, and then throwing in a series of spices. And then, of course, how would you know if you've thrown in enough spice or not? You would taste the fish. So she says, according to Dr. Desowitz, and I have no reason to doubt him because he is a, a, a Jewish person by uh, his uh, own traditions, and his mother obviously went through the ritual of, of making gefilte fish at various holidays. So he learned uh, secondhand by watching what actually goes on. And so you take a little bite and you can tell whether or not you've added the right amount of spices or not. And if you haven't, you can always add more. But the danger of that, of course, comes when, because I mentioned, you can't really distinguish the pleurocircoid stage of the parasite from the muscle fibers. The women would accidentally ingest a pleurocircoid occasionally as well. And so that became known as the Jewish tapeworm. Uh, rather than the fish tapeworm. But of course, it, it, it's got a larger uh, catch in terms of its hosts. So uh, Dr. Desowitz uh, does a very good job of describing the sociology surrounding the making of gefilte fish and the acquisition of this parasite as well. So the next time, we're going to discuss tapeworms of minor medical importance. Thanks very much for listening. 